Okay, I think we are all here. So good afternoon, everyone, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great pleasure to see you at a full house. Uh, before I'll ask Paul Modric to present his lecture, of course, I would like to introduce him a bit. Uh, he obtained his uh, BS degree at the MIT, uh, then followed with a PhD at the Stanford University in the lab of uh, Rob Lehman. Maybe you know him as a pioneer of DNA metabolism by identifying and characterizing the key proteins, DNA polymerase and ligase, which actually was one of the uh, topics of, of Paul. And then he stayed for a year as a postdoc at the Stanford and then uh, received uh, already a faculty position at Berkeley for two years and then followed with the faculty position at Duke where he stays since then. Now also uh, the HHMI uh, investigator. And already, uh, I mean, the start is, is clearly uh, designated by studying of DNA and DNA uh, uh, ligases and metabolic processes and of course his lab is focusing on mismatch repair. I'll not be introducing much mismatch repair because that's what he will do, but anyway, it's a process which is essential for repair of the errors that occur during DNA replication, despite having uh, the bases and polymerases that have the selection for individual nucleotides, and they have a proofreading activity, yet we still need a, a repair process that's able to eliminate the mismatches during replication. Uh, so his work was seminal uh, during uh, his career. He has, in his lab, uh, identified and fully characterized uh, 11 uh, bacterial proteins essential for the mismatch repair. Of course, developed numerous assays that allow their characterization and identification. Uh, later on, moved in, in looking for the homologs in mammalian system and again identifying numerous of these proteins which are conserved. And of course, identifying that mutations in these genes are linked with the severe diseases like a colon cancer, which is actually a principal candidate where the mutations are causative in the mismatch repair proteins. Uh, his work is, of course, uh, numerously cited, well, uh, well accepted by the colleagues and the field. Uh, due to that, he also received uh, numerous prizes, including uh, maybe I'll have to look in order just to make sure that I cite most of them. General Motor um, Mott Prize in Cancer Research, American Cancer Society Medal of Honor, uh, uh, Pfizer Award, Federal Linen Award, Robert and Claire Pearson Foundation Award. He's a member of numerous academies, uh, National Academy of, of Sciences, National Academy of Medicine, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, and, of course, received the, the Nobel uh, Prize in 2015 for chemistry. I'll not take more of my uh, spies for, for Paul and would like to invite him to present the lecture, but before that, also present him with the Mendel Medal for the achievement in the science. So please join me in thanking him. Okay. <laughs> and the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Lumiere, for that very kind introduction. This is my first time in Bruno, and, and it's a beautiful city, and I'm having a wonderful visit. And it's truly an honor to be in this home of Gregor Mendel, especially for me, because mismatch repair, which I have spent 40 years of my scientific career studying, was actually discovered because of a deviation in Mendel's first law in a small fraction of meiotic events. Okay. So, before I tell you about that mismatch repair work, Lumiere asked me, to say a little bit about how I got interested in science and the people that nurtured that interest. So I grew up in a very small town in the southwestern United States, a place called Raton, New Mexico. 
we had a tremendous degree of freedom as children, but there wasn't a lot to do there. Uh, we couldn't get television because the mountains blocked the signals, so we had to learn to entertain ourselves. And one of my favorite things was wandering the hills with my brother and, and our friends. And it's a, and we go back there frequently now. It's a beautiful country, ecologically and geologically diverse. And the evening skies on moonless nights are simply spectacular. And I think that environment had a lot to do with the development of my early interest in, in science. My father uh, was a coach. He coached football, basketball, and tennis. And, and athletics really were his life interest, but he was also my biology teacher, and he was a very good biology teacher. And as I said, we had a lot of freedom, and we did had opportunity to do things because of that freedom that young people today no longer have uh, because there are more rules now than there used to be. And I thought I'd tell you about one of those things, uh, my first experiment. So I was very interested in radioactivity. And, <laughs> and when I was 15, I found an ad in the back of a Scientific American uh, popular science magazine there where you could order small quantities of radioisotopes without a license. You'd be arrested if you did that today. So I talked my father into ordering them for me, and he did. And I, Two weeks later, he got a call from the train station saying, Mr. Modrich, we have this package here for you that says radioactive. Do not stand within 15 feet of this partial unless absolutely necessary. <laughs> <laughs> but he picked it up and he brought it home to me. There were about a half a dozen P32, sulfur 35, iodine 131, sodium 22, and several others. And I dissolved them up, and, uh, germinated seeds in them, put leaf cuttings in them, injected them into frogs, and then exposed them to x-ray film. And so when I told my, my wife, Vickers is also a scientist, and when I told her this story, she clearly didn't believe me. But when my mother passed away in 2002, we were going through her things, and my wife found the notebook describing these experiments along with autoradiographs, a couple of scans of which are shown here. And that notebook is now in the Nobel Museum. And Usa, Usa Husberg sent me this photo of her showing that notebook to a visiting school class. So as Lemire mentioned, I went to college at MIT. Uh, Boston was my first experience with a large city. As some of you probably know, MIT is fairly intense academically. The mantra of undergraduates for 100 years have been, has been tech as hell. And, and for a kid from Rato, New Mexico, it's a real culture shock. But with the help of some friends, I managed to adapt. I became very fond of Boston, and I loved MIT, which is where I was first exposed to the relatively young field of molecular biology, and which became my major. And my undergraduate advisor, was Salvador Luria, one of the fathers of molecular biology, and he was extremely kind to me. And it was during that period that I became interested in the origin of mutation, the nature of something called genetic recombination, and it seemed very clear to me that this could only be understood in terms of DNA biochemistry. So I went to graduate school at Stanford I worked with Bob Lehman, and then I did a short postdoc at Harvard Medical School with Charles Richardson, two of the world's great DNA biochemists, and also wonderful human beings. And I learned to do science working with these men, especially Bob, and I regard the time I spent in their lab as highlights of my scientific career. And so... And then I was on my own, setting up my own lab, and I sh shared my career with 70 PhD students and postdoctoral fellows and a number of collaborators. And many of them returned to Duke two weeks ago, in fact, for a reunion. And seeing them all again was truly wonderful. And I 
I hope they learned as much from me as I did from them. And I'll acknowledge their individual contributions as I go along. So, mismatch repair. So, the job of mismatch repair is to correct base pairing errors in the DNA helix. And this turns out to have major implications for the control of mutation production in cells. And Watson and Crick were the first to suggest that mismatches might occur in DNA. In their 1953 paper proposing the double helix, they pointed out that if the bases occur only in their favored tautomeric states, the keto and amino forms, then the possible base pairing schemes are restricted to the familiar GC and AT base pair. In their second paper, published a month later, dealing with the genetic implications of the double helix, they suggested that transition of a base to an unfavorable tautomeric form might be involved in mutation production. And, and two examples are, sho are shown here. For example, the enol tautomer of G forms a good base pair with thymine, and the imino tautomer of A, a good base pair, with cytosine. Well, as you all know, Watson and Crick were right. Mismatches like these do contribute to mutation production, but we now know that other mismatches also occur, as do other confirmations. And we know that as suggested by Robin Holliday 10 years later in, in a proposal to explain this deviation from Mendel's first law that I mentioned earlier, that these kinds of lesions provoke their own repair. And the first direct evidence for that idea was provided by bacterial transformation experiments. And my interest in this effect was prompted by the E. coli experiments done in Matt Messelson's lab at Harvard. And so Wagner and Messelson constructed artificial heteroduplex DNA, bacteriophage lambda artificial heteroduplexes containing multiple mismatch base pairs. And they showed that when a heteroduplex like this is introduced into the E. coli cell, those lesions trigger a repair response. And they also showed that what they called closely spaced mismatches, mismatches separated by about 1,000 base pairs or so, they're almost always repaired on the same DNA strand. And based on that strand bias effect, they suggested that mismatch repair may act to correct mutations that arise as replication errors. And if you think about this, in order to function in this manner, the repair system has to be able to do two things. It has to be able to recognize the mismatch produced by the replication error. But because that mismatch is comprised of Watson-Crick bases, it also has to be identify the new DNA strand that contains the mistake. And Pat Pukila, a postdoc in the Messelson lab, showed that strand direction of E. coli mismatch repair is dictated by the state of methylation adenine methylation at GATC sequences. And so this is important. So these methyl groups are added after DNA synthesis. So what that means is that DNA that's been around a while is methylated on both strands. But newly synthesized DNA exists in a transiently unmethylated form, and it's the absence of methylation on the new strand that directs repair to that strand. And Barry Glickman and Miro Radman showed that function of this E. coli pathway depends on the products of four so-called mutator genes, MUTH, MUTL, MUTS, and UVRD. And inactivation of any of those four genes increases mutation production in the E. coli cell about a hundredfold. And this gives you some idea of, of uh, the contribution of this pathway to mutation avoidance and genetic stability. Well, I found all this very interesting, and I was curious how mismatches might be recognized, how the state of methylation at one point on the helix could control the strand direction of mismatch repair elsewhere. And so to address those questions, we needed a biochemical assay. And the approach 
we used is summarized here. So Ollie and Lou, Michael Sue, and Bob LeHue constructed circular heteroduplex DNAs like that shown here in which the strands are in defined states of methylation at GATC sequences and that contained a mismatch in overlapping recognition sites for two restriction enzymes. And the example shown here, a GT mismatch in overlapping recognition sites for Hindi 3 and XHO1. And that mismatch blocks cleavage by both of these enzymes. But if repair occurs on the top strand, the GT mismatch is converted to a GC base pair and a good XHO1 site. And if repair occurs on the bottom strand, it's converted to an AT base pair, rendering it sensitive to Hindi 3 cleavage. So this uh, provides a very simple method for scoring mismatch repair in vitro and monitoring strand direction of the reaction. And using this sort of assay, Ollie and Liu was the first to demonstrate methyl-directed repair in extracts prepared from broken E. coli cells. And one of her first experiments is shown here, repair of a GT mismatch to a GC base pair. And I should point out, that just, just to make sure that everything in our assay is kosher, we always cleave the products with two enzymes, the enzyme diagnostic for mismatch repair, and then a second enzyme that cleaves somewhere else. And the example shown here is claw one. So repair products yield these two unique fragments that are shown here. But the really gratifying thing about this uh, repair in these extracts is they it depends on the products of the MUDH, MUDL, MUDS, and UVRD genes, which as I mentioned a moment ago, are required for the pathway in the cell. Wild type cells support mismatch repair, but extract from any of the mutant cells are dead. And I should point out that UVRE and UVRD are the same gene. And by mixing extracts from the different mutants, you can restore repair. And this sort of in vitro complementation, uh, as I'll point out in a moment, allowed us to purify all four of those proteins. But before I do that, I want to point out that we learned a fair amount, a fair amount about the methyl-directed repair by studying the extract reaction. Those experiments showed that the pathway recognizes all the base-based mismatches except CC, that repair re requires at least one hemimethylated GATC site that can function at a distance of 1,000 base pairs or more from the mismatch, and that the reaction occurs by an excision repair mechanism, removal and resynthesis of a segment of the unmethylated strand. And we got our first surprise when Michel Grilly and Michael Sue, in experiments done in collaboration with Jack Griffith, an old friend at the University of North Carolina, showed that mismatch provoked excision on the kind, these kinds of DNAs always removes a segment of the unmethylated strand spanning the shorter path between the two DNA sites. And this is true regardless of which strand is methylated because the two strands of the DNA helix are anti-parallel, this said that there's no obligate polarity uh, or orientation polarity of the two DNA sites and, and suggested strongly that the pathway is capable of bidirectional excision. So to figure out how it works, we isolated the MUTH, MUTL, MUTS, and UVRD genes products we knew from prior work in Peter Emerson's lab that UVRD encodes DNA helicase 2, which unwinds the two strands of the helix, excuse me, in an ATP-dependent fashion. But the other three proteins were unknown. And Michael Sue quickly showed that MUTE-S is responsible for mismatch recognition. Michelle Gurley showed that MUTE-L is recruited to the MUTE-S mismatch complex in an ATP-dependent fashion, but MUTE-L does not otherwise alter the covalent nature of the helix. And, and Ollie and Lou and Kate Welsh found that purified MUTE-H has a very tightly associated but nearly dead 
endonuclease activity that incises a hemimethylated GATC site on the unmethylated strand. But as you can probably guess, these four proteins are not sufficient, and using traditional biochemical approaches, we identified nine additional proteins and enzymes that are required for methyl-directed repair. And this permitted us to reconstitute the reaction using purified proteins and to establish basic features of its mechanism. So as I said a moment ago, isolated mutage is a nearly dead endonuclease that incises hemimethylated GATC sites on the unmethylated strand. And Karen O oh and Kate Wells showed that methyl-directed repair initiates by activation of this mutate nuclease in a manner that depends on mismatch recognition by mutes and assembly of the mutal mutes heteroduplex complex. Incision by activated mutate is targeted to the unmethylated strand at the hemimethylated site, and it can occur either five prime or three prime to the mismatch, consistent with the bidirectional uh, excision uh, mechanism that I mentioned uh, a moment ago. But the important point is that it's that, it's that strand break that is the real, and Bob Hughes showed that, it's that strand break that is the real signal that directs repair to the unmethylated strand. And I'll ask you to keep that in mind because I'll come back to that when I tell you about the human pathway. Assembly of the mutes mutel heteroduplex complex also activates the excision system, which is comprised of DNA helicase 2, the UVRD gene product, and several single strand exonucleases. And Vivian Dow and Miyuki Yamaguchi showed that mutes, the mutes mutel complex loads helicase 2 at the mutate strand break with an orientation bias, so unwinding proceeds back towards the mismatch. And that is true regardless of placement of that strand break, five prime or three prime to the mismatch. In other words, this system can establish the relative orientation of those two sites. Um, Bob LeHue, Deanie Cooper, and Vickers Burdett sh showed that this single strand that's displaced by helicase unwinding is then degraded by one of several single strand exonucleases. When the strand break is five prime to the mismatch, degradation of that segment depends on either exonuclease seven or rec J exonuclease. And when the strand break is three prime to the mismatch, excision is mediated by exonuclease one or exonuclease 10. And this yield then single strand gaps that span those two DNA sites, and that, th those gaps are repaired by the components of the DNA polymerase three holoenzyme complex. They're E. coli replicative polymerase, and although not shown here, is this break is then sealed by DNA ligase to restore covalent continuity to the helix. <sighs> And I should say two more things about this, I suppose. So uh, Anna Plushinik showed that these components of the pole 3 whole enzyme complex function only in the repair synthesis step of this reaction. They have no involvement in the mutate and the nuclease activation or in the excision step. And, and I mention that in passing because when I t describe the human pathway, you'll see that it differs in that regard. And I should also point out that this system clearly involves action at a distance. In the, exper in the experiment summarized here, the separation distance between the mismatch and the GATC site was 1,000 base pairs. And the fact that Mutes and Mutel mediate orientation loading of helicase 2 at the strand break implies that signaling between those two sites has to occur along the helix contour. <laughs>
And so the question is, how might that work? Well, several labs, including mine, have shown that MUTES and the MUTES mutel complex is, are capable of ATP-dependent movement along the helix. And the favored model in the field is that movement of this complex between the two sites is involved in uh, uh, coupling action at those two sites. But that ice is still a model. It has not been proven. And I, one last thing I should say is that vickers Burdett has also confirmed the involvement of those exonucleases in uh, mismatch repair as it occurs in the E. coli cell. So we're fairly confident that this mechanism is correct. So as our work on this pathway proceeded, we became, we were curious whether a similar strand-directed pathway might exist in higher cells, human cells. The problem was we had no idea what the strand signals might be. And I'll come back to that point in a moment. But before I do that, I want to introduce you to the proteins involved in the initiation of human mismatch repair because I think it'll make it, what I say later, easier to follow. So unlike E. coli, which has a, or bacteria, which have a single mismatch recognition activity, eukaryotic cells have two. And I'm only going to have time to talk about this one, the protein we call MUTES alpha, which is a heterodimer of the MUTES homolog 2 and MUTES homolog 6. MUTES alpha is the primary eukaryotic mismatch recognition activity. It recognizes all the base-base mismatches and small insertion deletion loops in which one strand of the helix contains several unpaired nucleotides. And the second protein I'll be saying a lot about we call MUTEL alpha. It's a heterodimer of MLH1 and PMS2. And like bacterial MUTEL, it's recruited to heteroduplex DNA in an ATP and MUTES alpha dependent fashion. So, as I said, when we began this work, the problem was what are the strand signals? And we had no idea. But as I mentioned when I told you about the E. coli pathway, the only function of the hemimethylated GATC site is to provide a strand break. The strand break is the real signal. So Jude Holmes, the MD-PhD student who began these experiments, constructed circular header duplexes with a strand break. Uh, these, and these strand breaks are called NICs in the jargon of the field. And he showed that these NICed header duplexes are excellent substrates for mismatch repair in nuclear extracts prepared from human cells. And as you can see, repair is restricted to the NIC DNA strand. There's no repair occurring on the covalently continuous strand. And Weihorn Fong, another student in the lab at the time, showed that excision repair tracts produced on these DNAs are restricted to the shorter path between the two DNA sites, regardless of three prime or five prime placement of the strand break. Again, it's viewed along the shorter path. And so this suggested a bidirectional excision capability reminiscent of that I've described in the E. coli pathway. And that turns out to be true, but as you'll see, the underlying mechanism is very different. So shortly after we identified that reaction, the De La Chapelle, Vogelstein, and Perusha laboratories reported that tumors in patients with Lynch syndrome, Lynch syndrome is one of the most common forms of hereditary cancer, they reported that tumors in patients with Lynch syndrome and a subset of sporadic cancers with Lynch-like features are characterized by microsatellite instability, frequent mutations in simple repetitive DNA sequences like poly A runs or CA repeats. Well, we knew from the work of Levinson and Gutman that in E. coli, microsatellite instability is diagnostic of mismatch repair deficiency. And I suspected that these tumor cell lines were defective in the human pathway. And Goman Lee, Jim Drummond, Matt Longley, and Weihorn Fong showed that this is true. Every tumor cell line with microsatellite instability that we tested, and some of them are shown here, 
proved to be defective and Nick directed mismatch repair. And we showed that in each, the, each of these cell lines is deficient in either mutes alpha or mutel alpha. That is, if we added back, well, I should <laughs> tell me this first. So each of these cell lines is deficient in either mutes alpha or mutel alpha, which we have purified, isolated in pure form. And the nature of this deficiency was demonstrated by the fact that when we add back mutes alpha to this, it restores repair. And we now know from work in a number of labs, work pioneered by Richard Kalodner and Bert Vogelstein, that heredity, hereditary defects in either of these two heterodimers are the primary cause of Lynch syndrome, one of the most common forms, as I said, of hereditary cancer. It, it accounts for somewhere between 3 and 5 percent of all colon cancers in the clinic. These last four cell lines shown here proved to be exceptional. Each of these lines was derived from a sporadic cancer. Sporadic cancers are cancers that have no known hereditary component. So each of these sporadic extracts of each derived from each of these sporadic cancer cell lines is also defective in mismatch repair. And in each case, repair can be restored to the extract by addition of purified mutel alpha, this heterodimer shown here. And Goman Lee and Jim Drummond showed by Western blot that each of these cell lines fails to produce the MLH1 polypeptide. Well, we shared that finding with some of our sequencing colleagues and they were quite skeptical because they had sequenced the MLH1 gene in this line and this line, and they found it to be normal. But Sandy Markowitz at Case Western Reserve University, with whom we were cl collaborating on those two vacuum cell lines, took us seriously, and collaborative experiments done in collaboration with Sandy, largely done in his lab, showed that the MLH1 gene in those sporadic cancer cell lines are epi is epigenetically silenced by CPG methylation within the promoter. The gene is perfectly normal, but it's not transcribed. The MLH1 polypeptide is not produced, and this results in a mismatch repair defect. And the proof of that is shown here. So uh, some of you may know uh, treatment of cells with 5-azocytidine transiently reverses cytosine methylation, and as you can see, that results in transient production of the MLH1 polypeptide. It turns on, and after several days, it turns off. And I mention this effect because it's very important in the clinics, where it is play, believed to play a causative role in about 15% of all colon cancers. So, in activation of the human mismatch repair system confers a strong predisposition to cancer. And although I've not pointed this out yet, inactivation of the pathway also results in a huge increase in mutation production. In the case of the human cells, almost a thousandfold. And the presumption is that it's that increase in mutation production that causes these cancers. And if I can comment on why that may be the case at the end of the talk, if anyone is interested. So, as I mentioned, we use those availability of those tumor cell lines allowed us to identify mutes alpha and mutel alpha. And this also provided the break we needed to begin studying the mechanism of the reaction. And by using, a, uh, in the, as we did in the case of the E. coli pathway, traditional biochemical approaches, and by extending genetic studies in several other labs, we identified seven additional proteins involved in human mismatch repair. And, and the nine proteins shown here are sufficient to reconstitute bidirectional human mismatch repair in a purified system. And I want to tell you about two strand-directed reactions uh, 
that are supported by subsets of these proteins. And the simplest is shown here. So the only exonuclease definitively implicated in eukaryotic mismatch repair is an enzyme called XO1, which, excuse me, hydrolyzes duplex DNA with five prime to three, three prime polarity. And when he was a postdoc in the lab, Jochen Genschel showed that XO1 is activated by mutus alpha in a mismatch dependent manner. Like bacterial mutus, mutus alpha is capable of ATP dependent movement along the helix, and we think this sort of movement is probably involved in coupling a action at those two DNA sites, which can be separated by as much of a, as a thousand base pair. But the important point is that activation by mutus alpha renders XO1 highly processive. An action of this processive complex is controlled by RPA, the human single-strand DNA binding protein, which displaces the processive complex from the helix after removal of about 200 nucleotides. And this RPA-filled gap is an incredibly poor substrate for XO1. Reloading of the exonuclease requires the mismatch-dependent assistance of mutus alpha. And so what this means is that this iterative cycle of removal of about 200 nucleotides continues until the mismatch is excised, at which point excision is dramatically attenuated because mutus alpha can no longer assist in that manner. And this provides a simple mechanism for termination of hydrolysis. Mutyl alpha is not required for excision in this system, but it modestly enhances mismatch dependence of the reaction, and, and mismatch specificity in this system is further potentiated by the poly-ADP ribose polymerase PARP1. Okay, so the second strand directed reaction is more interesting. Fried Kadyrov, Leo de Zantiev, and Nicoletta Constantine showed that unlike E. coli mutyl, Eukaryotic mutyl alpha is a latent endonuclease that's activated in a manner that depends on a mismatch, a pre existing strand break, mutas alpha, the PCNA DNA replication clamp, and RFC, the clamp loader that puts PCNA on the helix. So, for those of you who are not familiar with PCNA, PCNA is a trimeric clamp that can slide along the DNA it plays an important role in controlling access of certain proteins to the replication fork where it may, can also, in some cases, modulate their function. So mutyl alpha is an endonuclease. An action of this endonuclease is strand-directed. It is targeted to the heteroduplex strand that contains the pre-existing break. Incision can occur at a variety of sites. Uh, initial events appear to be biased to the distal site of the mismatch. This reaction occurs up with five prime and three prime heteroduplexes to yield molecules in which the mismatch is bracketed by five prime and three prime strand breaks. And Fried Kadyrov showed that five prime termini produced in this manner can serve as loading sites for two modes of mismatch removal. Hydrolytic removal by mutus alpha activated XO1, the reaction I described a moment ago, or by synthesis-driven strand displacement by DNA polymerase delta. DNA polymerase delta is a primary polymerase involved in mismatch repair. It, and it, like E. coli POL3 that I mentioned in the case of the bacterial reaction, it Play, it has an important role at the replication fork. So what happens is the polymerase loads the site like this, extends that three prime end, pushing this strand in front of it out of the way, and that fragment is released when the strand break is encountered. So, and so we think that this strand-directed endonuclease function of mutyl alpha is the primary activity of that protein in mismatch repair. And the reason I say that is shown here. So Fried Kadyrov identified a metal binding endonuclease active site motif located near the C-terminus 
of the mutyl alpha PMS2 subunit. This motif shown in red here. It's conserved in all eukaryotic PMS2 homologs, found in many bacterial mutyls. The notable exception are E. coli and its cousins that rely on GATC methylation to direct mismatch repair. So purified mutyl alpha has several uh, enzymatic functions that we can score. It's a weak ATPase. It, as I pointed out at the beginning, it assembles into these mutyl mutas heteroduplex complexes. So uh, amino acid substitutions within this endonuclease motif, uh, we've made the two shown here, those substitutions have absolutely no, function, no effect on ATPase function and assembly of the mutyl alpha, mutyl alpha heteroduplex com ternary complex is completely normal. But those substitutions inactivate the endonuclease and they abolish mismatch repair in human yeast and mouse cells. And in the case of mice, this is associated with strong cancer predisposition. So as I said, we think these experiments prove that the endonuclease function of mutyl alpha, mutyl alpha is its primary activity in mismatch repair. And this summarizes what we know about the mechanism of endonuclear mutyl alpha activation and the nature of strand direction in this system. So as I said, activation of mutyl alpha requires a mismatch, a pre-existing strand break, mutyl alpha, the PCNA clamp, and RFC, the clamp loader. Anna Plushinik and Leo Dezanti have showed that RFC involvement in this reaction is restricted to clamp loading. And they also showed that the only function of the strand break is to provide a PCNA loading site. So PCNA is loaded by RFC at three prime double strand single strand junctions. And that strand break provides that function. So as far as we can tell, the only actors directly involved in mutyl alpha activation are mismatch, mutyl alpha, and DNA-loaded PCNA. And we think loaded PCNA does two things in this reaction. Physical interaction of PCNA with mutyl alpha is required for endonuclease activation. And the orientation with which the PCNA clamp is loaded on the helix confers strand direction on endonuclease action. And, and hopefully the model shown here will clarify what I mean by that. So as I said, um, the preferred site for PCNA loading is a three prime double strand single strand junction. The two faces of PCNA are not equivalent and loading at a three prime double strand single strand junction uniquely orients the clamp relative to the absolute orientation of the helix, as indicated by these gold and blue colors here. Uh, Joe Jerichny's lab and Richard Kalodner's lab have shown that mutas alpha is tethered to the replication fork via physical interaction with PCNA, and both of these proteins are capable of movement along the DNA helix. Mismatch recognition by mutas alpha leads to recruitment of mutal alpha, which can interact with both of these proteins. Uh, Anna Plushinik showed that mutyl alpha interacts with the so-called C face of the clamp, which I've colored gold here. And the idea is that the asymmetry of clamp loading is preserved in the PCNA mutyl alpha complex. And this serves to orient the endonuclease active site within the PMS2 subunit relative to the two strands of the helix. So, as I mentioned when I started talking about these human, the human mismatch repair work, when we began, we had no idea what the biological strand signal might be. We now know that DNA methylation has no role in eukaryotic mismatch repair. But we think that the, reaction that I've, the reactions I've described suggest several possibilities, which can be illustrated with this schematic of the eukaryotic replication fork. For example, 
five prime termini on the lagging strand at the four, colored red here, would presumably support loading of mutus alpha activated XO1. And genetic results from the Kalodner and Kunkel labs are consistent with that view. And as I've said, strand direction of mutal alpha is controlled by the orientation with which the PCNA clamp is loaded on the helix. And in turn, that's in turn determined by three prime termini on the leading and lagging strands at the fork. So an obvious possibility is that DNA ends that occur naturally during the course of DNA replication may well serve as default strand signals that direct mismatch repair in the eukaryotic cell. Okay, so, uh, but we also think that the mechanism of strand direction in this system may have several other interesting implications. We, in fact, think there are three, but given the lateness of the hour, I will only have time to tell you about one of these. And that is, we think that mutal alpha function as an endonuclease may have implications for the mechanism of cadmium mutagenesis. So cadmium is a potent environmental mutagen and carcinogen that's been implicated in lung, renal, and prostate cancer. It's an industrial pollutant, but it's also concentrated from the soil by certain plants, including tobacco. And smokers, especially smokers in third world countries, have highly elevated blood cadmium levels. And once you have it, you have it for a really long time. The clearance times are measured in many years. The seminal observation in the mechanism of cadmium mutagenesis was made by Dmitry Gordinin at the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences. He showed that the mutagenic action of this metal is largely the result of selective inhibition of mismatch repair. And that finding led to multiple papers attributing that effect to inhibition of mismatch recognition and ATPase activities of mutus alpha. But I was always skeptical of that conclusion because the apparent KIs, cadmium inhibition KIs, were in the 100 micromolar range. And in fact, Manju Hingarani recently showed that cadmium inhibition of mutus alpha is completely nonspecific in nature. It involves binding of 100 cadmium atoms per 2,6 heterodimer. And she also showed that in, she could inhibit several off-the-shelf enzymes in the same way. But cadmium is a well-known inhibitor of zinc metalloenzymes, and we were prompted to reinvestigate this question by the fact that mutyl alpha endonuclease is a zinc enzyme. And this shows the active site of the C-terminal domain of yeast mutyl alpha, which was solved recently by Charbonnier and colleagues in France. Uh, it contains two bound zinc ions, and the endonuclease active site motif that I mentioned earlier plays an important role in their coordination. And Shannon Scherer, a postdoc in the lab, confirmed that human mutyl alpha is also a zinc enzyme. It co-purifies with two bound zincs. And Shannon also showed that one of the endonuclease dead variants, one of the mutants I mentioned earlier, within this motif results in loss of one of the bound zinc ions. But the really cool thing is Shannon showed that the endonuclease function of mutyl alpha is exquisitely sensitive to cadmium inhibition with an apparent Ki of 100 nanomolar comparable to the 80 nanomolar mutyl alpha concentration used in the experiments, indicating near stoichiometric inhibition. <clears throat> Excuse me. And although not shown here, this inhibition is reversed by zinc. The Ki for inhibition of the mutyl alpha ATPase, on the other hand, is nearly 100-fold higher, and we think that's probably a nonspecific effect, like I mentioned a moment ago. And the reason we think that this endonuclease inhibition is significant is shown here. So if you treat 
human nuclear extract with 50 micromolar cadmium, you inhibit mismatch repair by about 80%. And Shannon showed that this inhibition can be substantially reversed by addition of exogenous mutyl alpha, but not by mutas alpha. And this mutyl alpha reversal requires integrity of the endonuclease active site. And she also showed that exogenous mutyl alpha significantly rescues the mismatch repair defect in extracts prepared from cells treated with 5 micromolar cadmium, which is a biologically significant concentration. So we think that selective inhibition of mutyl alpha plays an important role in cadmium, I'm sorry, in cadmium mutagenesis and presumably in its function as a carcinogen as well. So I'm out of time. I'll stop there. Uh, I showed some of my colleagues. This lists all of my colleagues and collaborators in the mismatch repair work over the years. I won't go through the list because I acknowledge them as I went along, but as all of you know, none of this would have been possible without them. And I thank you for the invitation to be here today, and I'd be happy to try and answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for a wonderful uh, lecture. And now we have a few minutes for questions. So whoever is first brave to ask, maybe before you can think of the question. So my first one would be, what do you think about the redundancy? So there are several homologs of the human... Yeah, so uh, they actually differ in specificity. So, um, so the one I did not mention, mutas beta its preferred substrates are insertion and deletion loops of two to about 10 extra helical residue. Now there's some argument that they it may occasionally recognize base-base mismatches. We've not seen that in our work, but it may have. And uh, mutus alpha, as I indicated, recognizes base-base mismatches and insertion deletion loops of one to about three, but can also recognize much larger insertion deletion loops, but much with much reduced efficiency relative to mutus beta. So there's clearly overlap. And, and maybe the role of the meiotic specific you know, proteins? So the MSH45? MSH4 yeah, that, I don't know much about that, but my understanding is they're thought to play a role in resolution. Is, is that true? And um, there is another mute L that I did not mention, MLH13, uh, which also has the endonuclease function that I have described from mutal alpha. And my understanding is that endonuclease has been invoked in resolution of certain holiday junction uh, in, during meiosis, perhaps in concert with 4.5, MSH 4.5. Is that true? Yes, that's okay. true. Okay. Is there actually evidence that mismatch repair is regulated? So there are situations where you down-regulate or up-regulate and mismatch repair in order to control mutation rate? I mean, on the level of organisms or cell types? So, so uh, there are indications that there's some regulation during the cell cycle. Um, there may well be other forms of regulation, but I, I am unaware of, of definitive. You may be know more than I do about this. So, um, but mismatch repair has other functions and in addition to uh, replication error correction. It, it plays a role in suppressing certain ectopic recombination events. It plays a role in the DNA damage response to certain anti-cancer drugs. And it's also involved in certain cases, in two known cases, in the production of mutations. Uh, the production of mutations in, during the somatic hypermutation phase of immunoglobulin gene maturation and function of the pathway is also required for expansion of CAG triplet repeats, which is the cause of a number of neurodegenerative diseases, and that's one thing we're currently working on in the lab. Okay, maybe one more question from me. 
I've also read that perhaps the, uh, the incorporation of ribonucleotides during the synthesis yeah. might be a, a... A strand signal. A strand signal. On the leading strand. Yeah, there, so uh, some of you probably know that, that ribonucleotides are misincorporated uh, by DNA polymerases. I think pole epsilon on the leading strand is, is more... Uh, uh, it's a more common error in that case. So uh, several labs have argued so that those ribonucleotides are removed by the action of ribonuclease H2, which incises to produce a strand break. And Tom Kunkel and Chodorigny have suggested that those strand breaks may function to, as strand signals in mismatch repair. And I think that may well be true. However, the mute, if you look at the mutation rate, in ribonuclease H2 deficient cell, it's up about twofold, uh, much, much uh, compared to hundreds of thousand folds for inactivation of the MSH or MLH1 protein. So it may have a, a backup role, but my guess is that it's fairly modest. Okay. Is there any more questions, yeah, Vladimir? Thank you. So uh, basically, you mentioned that you, know, it's, you showed that uh, it's dependent on the methylation, the, the whole initiation of the repair. Um, and there are cell types which have, you know, hypomethylated, so like stem cells. Is there actually, or during the development embryo, uh, so is there actually a, a relation in um, usage of uh, mismatch repair and meth global methylation of the of the genome? Uh, you mean in, in stem cells? So I am unaware. So the me so. It's very clear that methylation can have can function to turn off mismatch repair, in, at least in certain tumor cells. There, in stem cells, my understanding is that some people believe that the mutation rate may actually be maintained at a lower level than it is in somatic cells, in, in conventional somatic cells, where the rate is about one in ten to the tenth, and I fairly sure that some people have shown that the mismatch repair protein levels, this come, may come back to your question, are significantly higher in stem cells than they are in typical somatic cells. Well, I have a question about the, the mismatch repair in cancer. So the pathway is generally important for suppressing the genome instability. Yes. But um, why specifically? That, why does it cause cancer? Yes, in colon, like yeah. a specific organ, or so, what's the phenotype? If it's important for the somatic hypermutations, um, I would expect in patients with the Lynch syndrome to have um, some kind of immunodeficiency. So I'm or, not sure I understand the question. Oh, yeah. Why, why is the reason why it specifically causes the colon cancer? Or well, yeah, so... What could it be? So, yeah, that's an excellent question. So, the, the, in the case of humans, the, the hereditary form of the disease is inherited in a heterozygotic fashion. So, the affected individuals have one functional copy and one defective copy of the gene in question, and their non-tumor cells are fine. They're proficient in mismatch repair. What you find in the case of the tumor cell is that the wild-type allele has been inactivated. And I won't go into the various arguments for this, but, but my perspective is that the tissue distribution of tumors in, in, in Lynch syndrome fashion is largely reflective of the tissue where the wild type allele is most likely to be lost. And I can tell you what that is later if you, why that is later if you'd like. Thank you very much. Happy to hear. Okay, if there are no more questions, well, first of all, I would like to close uh, the, uh, the series because this was the last lecture of this 13th year of Mendel Lectures. And, but don't forget that there is still a, a life science seminar series every Thursday. So see you then next week on, on another one. So thank you again, Paul, for coming and presenting your lecture. Thank you for your invitation.